Good evening and a very warm welcome to our brand new series of Antarctica Insight Live. If, if, you, if this is your first one, then welcome. And if, if you have been following us, then welcome back. It's great to have you join us. Um, this series, um, we will be spending the next few months over the winter or summer, of course, if you're in an Antarctic frame of mind, exploring Antarctica in a bit more detail, aspects both familiar and perhaps less well known. And we'll bring experts to you to share their insights into this endlessly fascinating place. My name's Camilla Nicholl and I'm the CEO of the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust and I'm delighted you're able to join us here on this very special evening. And it's special because on this day, 107 years ago, Sir Ernest Shackleton and his men finally lost their ship Endurance to the Weddell Sea. Shackleton had given the order a month earlier and almost uh, to abandon the ship and the whole crew set up camp on the pack ice in just to watch, really, the slow destruction and the final swallowing of the ship under the pressure of the ice. A devastating, I think, event. I think it's impossible, I think, to really appreciate how they must have felt, but it certainly accounts, many of us I'm sure will have read, um, from those who are there, brought this to life in all of its vivid horror. The story of endurance, of course, is perhaps one of the greatest stories ever told, and one for more than 100 years, we have been awed by, and not, not least the extraordinary circumstances, the utter devastation of the loss of the ship, and of course the leadership that Shackleton showed, and from which we learn still today. But until this year, it was a story we thought had perhaps, perhaps ended, but in fact was always to be continued. Back in March of this year, a feat almost thought impossible was achieved, and endurance lost the ice and to the depths of the Weddell Sea was found and what a find it has proven to be. Now that it has been found, our collective attention moves to what the what next. Um, so we're going to explore a little bit more about uh, the ship, the finds, and what happens next. And tonight it gives me huge pleasure to offer you some of those insights into the incredible achievements of the Endurance 22 expedition, led by the Falkland Island, uh, Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust, and into the future protection of what is perhaps the most remote and most the worst, worst to access, access shipwreck in the world. With me tonight, I have the man who led the Endurance 22 expedition, Dr. John Shears, a highly experienced polar scientist and logistician, and whose extensive experience was brought to bear in the most extraordinary fashion in the planning and execution of this expedition. And we also have Hefin Mira, a maritime archaeologist and the national listing advisor for marine heritage for Historic England, which of course includes shipwrecks, and who's been seconded to work with us at the Antarctic Heritage Trust to devise the conservation management plan for Endurance. And together tonight, we're going to explore endurance um, and discuss uh, the find, the future, um, and all, all more, much more besides, I'm sure. So welcome both of you tonight. I'm also pleased to say that John, hi, <laughs> I'm pleased to say John and Heffin are happy to take your questions from, um, from the audience. So please do post your questions in the chat, uh, in the comments, and we will put them to, the, to our experts tonight. So John Heffin, great to see you both. Um, what, a, what an amazing thing to be talking about uh, 107 years after it was it was crushed by the ice and those devastating images that we we've seen and we have become so familiar with and in march this year you were on a ship john you found this ship take us back a little bit take a, tell us a little bit about what's so significant about its endurance and why why bother even looking for it at all well in endurance as you quite rightly said in your introduction she's an absolutely legendary ship because of her association with Sir Ernest Shackleton. Um, the manner in which she sank in the pack ice, uh, Shackleton taking all the men onto the ice, camping on the ice for months, when they had really no chance of knowing whether they, they, they were going to get back alive. And Shackleton, through his leadership, keeping them all together, keeping the morale going, and then man managing to get all the team to Elephant Island, uh, on the northern end of the Antarctic Peninsula. And then Shackleton taking the decision to take the, the largest lifeboat they have, the James Caird, and to sail 800 miles across the Southern Ocean to try and raise the alarm at South Georgia. It, it really is the, the stuff of uh, uh, amazing adventure stories. Uh, so, so the ship is always associated with, with Shackleton. Um, and then, of course, where, that, where the wreck lies uh, in the... The, the Weddell Sea. Um, you can find the photograph you can see behind me. That is the Weddell Sea, um, taken from earlier this year when we we're on uh, our ship, the SA Gullis II. And it is the most remote, one of the most remote places on the planet. Very, very few vessels have ever been there. 
So it's a, a very difficult place to even get to, let alone search for a wreck. So everything associated with the story is really quite amazing. You might say madness, in fact. <laughs> but, uh, but of course, this was not your, not your first attempt, was it? Um, you did uh, lead an expedition in 2019, is that right? What was different between the two? Tell us a little bit about that and what was different. Yeah. Time. So, so, so I've been fortunate to now lead two expeditions into the Weddell Sea to search for and locate the endurance. So the first one was in 2019, it's called the Weddell Sea Expedition. Uh, I was the leader for that. Um, and uh, we used the same ship, the SA Gullis II, fantastic icebreaker owned by the South African uh, government, uh, which we chartered um, and we used the same vessel again for this, this year. Um, with, in 2019, we got to the wreck site and we had our autonomous underwater vehicle, basically an underwater robot, underneath the ice searching. Um, been going extremely well for 30 hours, and then we just suddenly lost it, lost all signal. We had no idea where, where, where it disappeared to. So uh, that was a, a big, big catastrophic problem for the expedition. We had to basically then go and search, search the AUV, um, weather was closing in, we were going down to minus 20 degrees, and I had to make the very difficult decision to pull us out. So, so, so we lost the AUV, so yeah, a seriously serious and costly mistake. You know, each AUV is worth you know, many millions of pounds. So I thought that was it. I thought I'd never get the job again. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, uh, but um, the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust gave me a call August 2020 and said, would I be interested in leading another expedition? So I thought about it for all of a second, said, yes, I'll go. And uh, yeah, we went back in again, but, but we learned the lessons. I think that the key thing there is we learned the lessons from what happened in 2019. We knew that we had an excellent ship, but we knew that we had to change the way that we used our autonomous underwater vehicles. And uh, for, the, for this expedition, we brought in a new subsea project manager, a guy called Nico Vincent. And Nico is from France very, very experienced marine engineer. And he came up with this idea of using uh, a hybrid autonomous under, underwater vehicle, which is attached to the ship by a, a fiber optic tether. And that I think was a game changer for us going into the Weddell Sea. We had a fantastic team um, using the same ship. And I think the other big difference this year for us was the sea ice. In 2019, it was very difficult to get onto the site. It took us about three days of heavy ice breaking to get there. This time, the ice was completely different. And indeed, this year in the Weddell Sea, it's been the lowest ice, uh, ice on record. So we had a little bit of luck with us as well. That The ice was really, really thin. We had lots of open water, and that meant that we could get onto the site quite easily and then work across the site quite easily. So uh, yeah, it was a combination of factors um, but with some meticulous planning. Um, and to do all of this during COVID was a you know, huge, huge effort by everyone involved. Yeah, I'm super proud of the whole team. It was a great effort. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I mean, extraordinary, really. I mean, I remember watching you uh, with the twenty in, in twenty nineteen, and you know, that, that, it was so knife edge, wasn't it? And then this this time, you know, again, we were, I don't know, other people, I was wrapped, you know, uh, following the social media and things, and just hoping. And then as the story was unfolding, that the sea ice you could get a bit closer, to you, the sea ice was, you know, suddenly. If I don't know, I felt hopeful that uh, you might yeah. be successful, and indeed you were. Yeah. Just a little bit. I mean, you very high tech. Um, equipment you're using, you know, this is cutting edge technology. Um, uh, you know, nobody else is using this sort of stuff at the moment, are they? But you also, I think, if I'm right, um, you went back to the, went back in history. You used the historical records. You, know, you went back to uh, Worsley's recordings and, and sightings and things. Can you talk a bit about about that and how you brought together the historic with the with the cutting edge and the GPS and all of that? Yes. Um, so. Uh, our director of exploration, um, our marine archaeologist, Munson Bound, uh, spent a lot of time in the archives at Scott Polar Research Institute and other institutions, including going to the archives uh, in Norway, uh, because Endurance was originally built in, in Norway. So we did a lot, of, a lot of work in the archives, and Munson came up with, with a search box um, where we, we thought the vessel would be located, because Shackleton had a fantastic ship's master. Uh, he was called Captain Frank Worsley from, um, from New Zealand. And in the early 1900s, uh, Frank Worsley was probably the world's most experienced 
and excellent navigator. Um, he was fantastic at using uh, the sextant and, and working out exactly where he was. And to my mind, he's a bit of an unsung hero in the Shackleton story. Everyone thinks of Shackleton as the person who saved them. But actually, if they hadn't had Worsley giving them their positions and knowing exactly where they were uh, in the Weddell Sea and then when they were on the, uh, on the boat journey going to uh, South Georgia, then everyone would have perished. So he's, to, to me, he's, he, he's, he's, he's the main man. Uh, Worsley really saved them. Um, and he took meticulous records, which you can still find in the archives at Scott Polar Research Institute. So uh, Worsley's diary is at, at Scott Polar, uh, Shackleton's diary is there. So a combination of using all of these records gave us a very good idea of where the wreck was likely to be in the Weddell Sea. Uh, then Menson drew a search box um, where we thought the wreck would be, be located. And then it was my job to get us onto the search box, uh, mm. coordinating all the effort. And then once we got onto the search box, then that was, uh, I'd then pass over control to Nico, Nico Vincent, our subsea project manager, and Nico would control all the subsea operations. So yeah, it was a, you know, the, the combination of, of using those historical records with the modern technology was absolutely crucial to our success. Yeah, and that, and I think very much um, communicating that, that team effort and the team effort required in Shackleton's day, as you say, talking about Worsley, and we know other characters in the expedition that were critical to the success of the saving of the, his crew, and equally, you know, the team effort went into you know this critical success of of, of this expedition, of course. Um, so it's it's amazing how these resonances are the same. I mean, I'm sure, like like me, you've read a lot of the historical accounts, you know. Um, Shackleton's diaries and things like that uh, that describe the journey and describe what it was like being on the, cap on the pack ice. I mean, you spent a lot of time on the ice, I think. Um, did you find there were resonances between your experiences and those that you may have read about in the in the historical records? Uh, yes, yes, Camilla. Yeah, I think particularly for me when um, I was able to get off the ship, mm. uh, the, yeah, Agulhas two and uh, Endurance completely completely different. You know, modern icebreaker uh, Agulhas two was built in. 2012, you know, 100 years after. Uh, but once you get onto the ice, and this is a picture of me on, on an ice floe, you know, to actually be standing there uh, 107 years on from you know, when Shackleton had actually stood in the very same location, uh, it was a very awe-inspiring moment. Um, and it's still a very difficult environment to be in. You know, the temperatures at times were, were dropping down to minus 15 degrees centigrade. Um, we, had, we had to contend with blithers, blizzards. Uh, yeah, there's always the danger with the sea ice that it might, might break up. So that there are risks associated with what we were doing uh, today, just as they were with Shackleton over 100 years ago. But for me, there was a, you know, a real tangible link between being able to stand on that sea ice as uh, Shackleton had done over 100 years ago. And to, to be in that sort of moment, I thought was... Yeah, that that would be something that will live with me forever. I'll bet. I'll bet. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But of course, you found it. You found endurance. So, <laughs> what was that moment like? Tell us about that. Uh, <laughs> well, I can see. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, I, well, well. I'm super relieved here. Super relieved. Very happy. I'm with mm. with, with Menson here, and we're in the control room, and we've just seen some of the first images of the of the wreck. Um, so we found found the vessel on the fifth of March. Uh, 2022, um, I was extremely worried because we were into day 18 of the search, uh, winter was coming in, um, temperatures were dropping, um, and I was so worried, in fact, that um, I decided to take, take, take my mind off actually calling off the search because we were very near the end of our search period. We only had about another two or three days on site mm. before we'd have to come off. Um, so I took Menton off and we walked off um, you can walk on, it's very safe to walk on the sea, sea ice, at least in that particular locality. And we walked to see an iceberg. And um, we'd been off the ship for a couple of hours and we're walking back. And I don't know why, but I said to him, um, I've got a really good feeling about today. I think, I think she's beneath our feet. And I've never said that before. I've been on the ice nearly every day when we were um, on board the ship uh, to help the scientists with their work. And um, 
so we're walking back and I'd said this and then we got back to the ship and then the tannoy starts blaring out saying shears and bound to the bridge shears and bound to the bridge and uh, I thought we lost another AUV that's it. honestly <laughs> that's what I thought I thought oh, okay. how am I going to explain this to the people back in London you know another multi-million pound loss well done shears you know, go and get another job and um, <laughs> but so it's shears and bound to the bridge shears and bound to the bridge so we race up and um, yeah, and there, and the chap on the right of the image there, that's Nico Vincent standing up. So Nico was on the bridge looking very glum, actually. So I thought the worst, I thought we had lost the AV. And he just got up and uh, he showed me his iPhone, put his iPhone uh, right in front of my face and said, oh, gentlemen, let me introduce you to the endurance. And they had this incredible high frequency sonar picture. Uh, got the, uh, the, the, the subsea guys would use sonar because it's got uh, better penetration through, through water and they can look for, uh, f farther, uh, f further afield using sonar than they can if they're using a film, a visual camera. And uh, so there's this high frequency image of the wreck and it was just perfect. You, know, you could see the ship was all in one piece. You could make out the bow, the stern, you could see the mast, you could see the funnel. Uh, it was incredible. I was just completely dumbstruck for about 10 seconds and then the bridge just erupted. <laughs> Everyone was jumping around, <laughs> hugging each other. Um, yeah, it was an absolutely brilliant, brilliant moment after, after everything we'd been through, the first expedition, second expedition, and being so close to failure again, to, if you like, pull it, pull it out of the bag right at the last moment. Unbelievable. Absolutely, absolutely. And it really well preserved. I mean, extraordinary. I mean, we see shipwrecks, and we'll talk to you in a minute, Heaven, about uh, the state of shipwrecks generally. But the endurance, I mean, clear as a bell. I mean, extraordinary images. I mean, these are the ones that were shared live across the world um, on the day you announced, which is actually my birthday. So you made my day that day. You must well, be surprised well, to see it like this. Yeah, <laughs> well, we will. Well, we always like to deliver for the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, Camilla. So, Very uh, much appreciated. <laughs> um, but yes, um, I think w we were just astounded as well at the condition of the wreck. I think Menton's on record of saying that uh, in 40 years of looking at uh, wooden shipwrecks, and he's like a world expert, that he's never seen a ship like uh, Endurance preserved in the way she is. Um, it, it is quite incredible. And, and I'm on record of saying, that it's as if she sank yesterday. You can look at those very famous pictures which you showed earlier from Frank Hurley. And there's a picture taken by Frank Hurley, I think on the 8th of November, 1915, the last photo before Endurance sank and you can see the ice on top of the vessel. And you look at that picture from 1915 and you, know, you go back now to 2022 and the vessel is yeah, it's as if she sank just yesterday. It really is quite incredible. So, you know, you can see this, you know, this is the stern, you can see the wheel. Um, if we just stay with that image, because you know, uh, what's also really powerful is that um, you can see the, the porthole there on the right-hand side of the image, that's Shackleton's cabin. You know, the captain's cabin. So that's, that's Shackleton's cabin there. Um, so you can literally just go down, to the, down the companionway and just off to the right, that's where Shackleton was sleeping. But the, the state of condition, you know, where you can see the wheel, you can st still see the chains for the steering apparatus. Um, and, and also, you know, bits and pieces of the rigging are still there. Uh, it, it is quite incredible, the condition that she's in. Um, also, and I d another thing that we weren't quite expecting was that she's like this, uh, this, this artificial reef um, mm -hmm. at 3,000 meters in the Weddell Sea. And she's full of full of life you can see it on the you know, the taffrail there um surrounding her so you know the sea stars anemones um uh um starfish um you know, it it is quite incredible what's actually living on the wreck as well yeah amazing absolutely amazing so you found it you captured images that have beamed across the world a few days later i mean this was could be your one chance to capture it as, as fully as possible so how what did you do what, what did you how did you go about that what did you what did you, how did so, you capture so, it? so so once the subsea guys had done the um uh, uh had detected it with the so sonar then they next went down with a very high resolution camera uh, and photographic rig um took lots of uh film footage, photographs of the wreck, uh, and then 
they did a final dive using a, a LIDAR, basically a laser. Uh, and at the same time as the laser's firing, it's taking photographs. So it, it, it is quite incredible, the technology. So being able to um, have, um, be able to create a 3D uh, computer model of the wreck down to about one millimeter resolution. Um, the subsea guys have taken in excess of 25,000 photographs of the wreck. Uh, all that is now going through post-processing um, with the instrument manufacturers called Voyas in Canada with McMill, uh, uh, McGill University, also in Canada. And then the final stage is there. Um, I was talking to, to Nico just a couple of days ago, and they're about 98% finished now with the, the post-processing. So once once we have that, it will be, I can, I can assure you and the audience that the imagery is just incredible, just incredible. It will be, it's, you know, the show hasn't finished yet, folks. There's Indeed. Going to be, there's going to be some, um, some amazing uh, uh, data and imagery, um, which will be hopefully being unveiled end of this year, beginning of next year. Right. We can't wait, honestly, because we, probably on behalf of the whole audience, we can't wait. OK, so I mean, I'm going to pause there because you can talk a bit more about that in a minute. But I'm going to turn now to Heffin. So now a wreck has been found and, a, you know, one of the most extraordinary and most famous shipwrecks um, ever. <laughs> um, tell us, what, is, what is protecting historic wrecks? I mean, of course, it's there. It's very difficult to get at. But there are risks, of, of course, associated. And now we know it's there. It's been designated a historic site and monument under the Antarctic Treaty. So therefore, it now needs some sort of protection and some, some thought about it. Tell us a little bit. You, you work with historic wrecks around in British waters uh, um, around the place. Tell us a little bit about what protection of historic wrecks um, involves. What, what does that mean? It's, it's so exciting to see the footage and, and to see the photographs and to, to hear about the shipwreck. You know, it's although it's it's such a different context to what we're used to dealing with you know it's so deep and it's so isolated that it makes it completely unique in that respect but in many other ways it's it's exactly the same as as the challenges we face with with shipwrecks around england that we have to deal with so um we we manage uh, 57 shipwrecks that are designated under the protection of wrecks act and they range from um early scatters of bronze age cargo uh, through to wooden warships and all the way through to um uh, much more modern ships. We've got German submarines from the First World War and um, early prototype Royal Navy vessels. So it's you know, a massive range of, of sites and different ship types. But but the key things is very similar to what we we'll have to be looking at with endurance as well. It's it's identifying what's there. You know, what is the condition? We we've seen these photographs so far and this all this data that's been collected and it's going to be so exciting to to go through this and to to, to establish. Um, exactly what's there, what survived, and 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 how that condition is now. Because going going forwards, there's going to be um, well, there's going to be some risks to the site now that the, now that the, that position is known. So that's an important thing that we need to think about. Uh, as as well as that, there's going to be ongoing effects from as as the site slowly decays. So it's it's in fantastic condition, but it's still important to uh, to be monitoring that and to see how it is changing over time. Um, the other thing that's really interesting as well, of course, is how how climate change is going to be affecting the site. You know, we, we're seeing on the sites that we're monitoring in the UK and around England that uh, we're seeing increased storm activities damaging these sites and things like that, which is, of course, very different because we're dealing with quite shallow sites uh, compared to the endurance, but different different effects like that have to be taken into consideration as well, and I think that's that's really important as well. Hmm. I think it's important questions, aren't they? I mean, I mean, you you sound you know sort of surprised by the the, the condition of the ship. I mean, I, I remember seeing uh, you know a few photographs of shipwrecks. I remember um, Erebus and Terror when they were found a few years ago. I mean, the, I think only best to be described as woolly. I mean, utterly covered <laughs> in seaweed and, and algae and all these kinds of things. Um, mm. And you kind of see an outline of a ship, but it's mostly seaweed, isn't it? This is remarkably well preserved, isn't it? Do you, uh, what do you think might be contributing to that? Do you have a, 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 any notions around that? I think you know the the extreme depth, the the, the cold. It's it's all going to have such an important impact there. You know, you can see although it is incredibly deep, there's still life on there. You know, it is it is still mm -hmm. a um, gonna there's going to be a, a um, an ecosystem around that shipwreck, and that that as well is going to be an important thing in in how we decide how to look after ship going forwards. It's it's a 
of course, as well, because we know exactly when it sank, we've got that perfect point in time information in terms of how you know we can assess how how long it's taken for these um, colonies of life to to develop on on the shipwreck. So that's quite exciting in itself, I think, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And to think about this kind of protection, the conservation management plans. I mean, we at HD, we look like, look after buildings that you can visit on a regular basis, and you can make decisions about the structure and that kind of thing. But a ship that's sitting 3,000 metres down in, you know, in the sea, mostly covered with ice most of the year, um, why does it matter that we make some decisions about the preservation or protection uh, of, of a ship like Endurance, and particularly where it is? Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's just really important, isn't it? Because as as the technology is evolving and as things become more accessible and there's more and more opportunities to undertake projects, it's really important that we decide now what that framework is going to be and how, how do we go about determining if a, if a project is, is um, going to give us new information and is going to, going to, going to help tell that story, help preserve the, the wreck for the future. And, um, and I think that, you know, now is a perfect time to do that while, while there's you know, all this information, we've got this wonderful uh, point in time data set to help us develop an understanding. There's been all this fantastic documentary research that's been undertaken. So it's it's great to be able to combine the historical narrative, the historical research, and this absolutely cutting edge technology to to, to develop a, um, a a plan and a way forward for the site for the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as, as John was saying, climate changing, you know, the good sea ice conditions allowed you to get into the into the area this year, in, earlier this year, that may continue as climate warms. And so therefore, other vessels may be getting into the area and there may be more interest. Is that is that something you're getting a sense of, John? Do you think? Well, well, I certainly, concerned certainly about or? yeah, um, and I was at a meeting a couple of months ago and Professor Mike Meredith was there from the British Antarctic Survey, very distinguished oceanographer. And um, he was asked a question about the sea ice in the Weather Sea. And he said, you know, the, the latest uh, measurements that they're doing at the British Antarctic Survey, the modelling that they're doing is suggesting that, you know, we could be a bit of a, a tipping point in the Weddell Sea now. And you could be seeing uh, sea ice retreat um, happening, you know, quite quickly, you know, perhaps you know, mirroring what's happening up in the Arctic because of climate change. You know, the, um, the, uh, the poles are, are, are regions which are warming extremely rapidly on the Antarctic Peninsula, it's, it's warmed by about three degree, three degrees centigrade over the last 50 years. So, so um, warming temperatures, uh, particularly ocean warming, are affecting the Weddell Sea right now. Um, and although it was very fortunate for us that we were able to get in with very low sea ice, you know, that could be just an indicator of what's to come in the Weddell Sea. Um, now, in terms of access to the sites, it still remains extremely difficult. But in, in you're still in, an icebreaker. Yeah. You still need an icebreaker. But, yeah. but in, you know, in five or ten years' time, twenty years' time, um, that the, the, the site I think will be much more accessible because there'll be less sea ice. So Heffin's completely right. You know, we've got to uh, uh, we've got a good opportunity now before there's pressure on the site to get a management plan in place to protect it for the future. Uh, without you know uh, vessels all queuing up to go and to go and see it, and you only have to look at say the Titanic, another deep water wreck, uh, and there are multiple expeditions which go to the Titanic every year um, with deep sea submersibles, um, you know. And people listening to this might be thinking, "Well, that's you know, that's never going to happen, John." I can assure you that I, that Shackleton a hundred years ago would never have thought that we could access his ship. In a hundred years' time, uh, I think you know, technology is such that you could well see you know, people wanting to basically dive on the vessel, for example. So I think I think there's a very good opportunity now to get everything in place uh, and to get a, you know, a series of um, controls and procedures ready, whilst 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 the uh, the ship is not under any particular uh, threat from human activity. Mm. 
No, I think I think that's actually spot on, isn't it? It's, it's kind of you know you're thinking these timescales. This is 20, 50, fifty, a hundred years that we're planning for here, isn't it? It's kind mm. of and trying to think about what the risk profiles profile is going to be for the ship. Um, this is this is something a bit new for Antarctica, though, isn't it? And um, under the Antarctic Treaty, there this is the first ship that's ever been created as a historic site and monument. Um, it's the first ship, a first uh, wreck um, that's that um, is going to have a management plan. Um, having first um, what what are you going to reach for to guide you in the uh, when you're working on this with you know with members of my team? What what what's, what are guidance are you going to follow? Are there standards out there that we you know that you that you think about? How do you make decisions about wrecks? So so we we work very closely with uh, there's, there's several sort of in, international uh, codes of practice and standards that we tend to work with. So there's the uh, the one that forms the key. The, the framework that we work around are the rules to the annex of the UNESCO Convention 2001 on the protection of underwater cultural heritage. Uh, the UK government isn't a signatory to the convention, uh, but it has uh, does follow the the rules that are in the annex of that as best practice. Uh, and so that's really important for how how we frame any work that would go forwards on on a protected wreck, for example. Um, and so it's things like that that are are very important, and it's just ensuring that. Um, any activities that do take place are thought through completely from the very beginning, right, right the way through to the very end in terms of making proper project designs and, and making sure everything is costed and that everyone knows what they're doing and there's this, you know, full tasks and timescales, which is all, all really, really important to ensure that these, uh, that a project is done properly. We'd often, you know, we'd, we'd be looking at, um, well, preservation in situ was as the first instance as as how to go about looking after a shipwreck site, and the, mm. you know the endurance from from what we've seen here is it's in a fantastic condition. It's it's um it's in a great condition where it is at the bottom of the seabed is the safest place for it. So that that would always be our starting point, uh, and then it's a matter of articulating what is the significance of this particular shipwreck. You know, why why is this one important? And in, and in here we, it's it's such a clear and fantastic story and we all you know everyone is so engaged in that historical narrative but so the the historical uh, story behind uh, the exhibition is is fantastic and is is so captivating but also the the ship itself is 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 unique you know it's it's it wasn't any old ship it's a fun you know purpose built ship for exploration and for for going in the arctic so things like that are really important to work out and so and once you've got the the um you teased out the significance and what's so important about it it enables us to work out um what we need to to, to ensure is is kept safe and is kept in in good condition and then how we go about formulating a a forward plan to achieve those aims yeah no it's rigorous stuff isn't it uh, you touched on something there every time i think this is the question probably lots of people want the answer to but mm. uh, I mean, both of you really i mean big question is will endurance ever be raised I mean, John, as the as a you know, is someone going to come to you, tap you on the shoulder, say, "Okay, in twenty twenty four, John, let's let's go and raise it." What, what would you say to them? <laughs> no, no. As as you've already said, Camilla, the the, the wreck is protected under the Antarctic Treaty. It's, um, it's, yes, it's, it's yeah. protected on you know, on the seabed. So, so one, you know, let's let's be clear about it. It's protected under the Antarctic Treaty, so in situ. Um, se second second point is. You know, certainly the, the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust Endurance 22 team, we've got no plans to, uh, uh, to, to go back and try and raise it. Um, the, the, the other point, yeah, a very practical thing, is that, as you can see from behind me, you know, trying to do this sort of thing at 3,000 3, metres with uh, 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 sea ice all around you, um, te technically impossibility. So... So the very best place for that ship is on the seafloor. You know, she's lasted extremely well for 170 years, hardly any, any change to her at all. And what Heaven didn't point out is that you know, part of the, uh, the very special conditions in which she sits, um, um, because in the Weddell Sea, there are no wood boring worms. It's too cold for that. So a wreck in more temperate waters, um, any, all the wooden timbers would have basically disappeared by now. But because there are no wood boring worms in Antarctica, that's a primary reason why the ship is in such good condition. Also, the water temperature at that depth, it's, um, you get what's called Antarctic bottom water. It's very, it's very saline. It's very cold. So it's about minus 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, at that sort of temperature. 
So there's a combination of circumstances which uh, protect the wreck. Also, the wreck is, um, as Heffern pointed out, you know, she, she was designed to go up to the Arctic um, originally before Shackleton bought her. Um, after the Fram, Abenson's sh ship, she's probably the second strongest wooden vessel ever built. So part, part of the reason that she survived is because she was so strongly built in the first place. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think the very best place for her, uh, and certainly that's what the Falkland Maritime Heritage Trust believe, uh, the, the expedition team believe, is to keep her in situ on the seabed. I think you're amongst friends there, John. I think heaven is that, that yes, you probably will take too, is it? <laughs> okay, so just before we move on to audience questions, and I uh, see there's lots building up there, uh, what happens next? So John, what's, what's, wh where next? What's um, happening next with the, the footage you've, you've gathered? And you know, wh when, will, when will we hear more? So, so, so two things there, you know, the data, um, final stage of processing. Uh, we've got a science workshop with the science team um, in early January in Bremen, in Germany. So we're hoping that that will be the showcase for the data and allow scientists to see that for the first time. Uh, and then following on from that, um, there'll be a very big National Geographic uh, movie. It's going to have a theatrical release. Um, so you'll be able to see it in cinemas near you. Um, and probably coming out for release end of uh, next year, beginning of 2024. So uh, throughout, of, throughout next year, I think there are going to be a, a number of big announcements coming out of uh, the Falklands Maritime Heritage Trust and Endurance 22. Um, so, uh, so, so the wreck isn't going to go away. And of course, you're, you're, guy, you're going to be working on the management plan as well. So I think for those people who are so, so interested in the story, and I know that the, I think we've got over 500 people just on this <laughs> webinar tonight. So it, it really has... Um, got people's attention. People are fascinated by it. So there's going to be a whole range of different announcements going through next year and into 2024, um, where people can continue to, um, you know, get their get their fix of the endurance and Shackleton. It's <laughs> what we all want, honestly. And Heffin, what about you? What, <laughs> what's happening? What happens? What happens next with you? You're, you're working with us at EKHT um, on this management plan. Just uh, unfold that for us a little. Well, I think I think it's it's. We're right at the very beginning of the process just now, and I think it's it's so important to emphasise that this isn't just us working on, in isolation on this project. It's it's very much going to be a consultative process with Endurance 22 and Falkland Maritime Heritage Trust, and there's so many other stakeholders and interesting parties, uh, including the Shackleton family and everybody. So there's a there's a it's a huge um, joint project working between everybody to make sure that all these views and all all these. Uh, uh, diff different options are considered and, and looked at. But right now, from, from a timetabling point of view, we're making a start on the project now with the aim to get a draft in place for, for March of next year so to take to the Antarctic Treaty meeting. So that's our, our first major milestone coming up and we're yeah very excited. Wonderful. Thank you both very much. So we have um, dozens of questions for you. Um, we shall pick some good ones for you. Um, so thank you everybody who have submitted questions. Um, if I could take the first one, please. Here we go. Uh, Mr. Cheers, uh, are there any plans for a new expedition to the Endurance or did Endurance 22 do all the mapping with the wreck, even with little time in March? Okay. Well, we've got some, <laughs> some viewers from far, far afield. Okay, Absolutely. so there, 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 there are no plans for, for, for a new expedition. Um, certainly not, not at the moment. Um, and part of that is because Endurance 22 did, did, a fa did do a fantastic job. So Nico and the subsea team, um, by uh, finding the wreck, then going down with super high resolution 4K cameras, with the photography, the video uh, that we've now achieved, plus then with the laser scanning uh, down to one, one millimeter resolution, it, uh, we've got all the data that we need to ensure that uh, Heffin and the team have got exactly what they require from the management plan. So there's no need to go back to the wreck uh, right now. But as Heffin was saying, you know, if you want to monitor the wreck, then maybe in 10 or 20 years' time, and certainly if I'm still going in 10 years' time, I'd be delighted to go back. Uh, it's, um, yeah, the Weddell Sea is a very, very special place. And uh, yeah, if someone asked me to go back in 10 years' time to do a monitoring survey, for Heritage England, yeah, I'd be the first to volunteer. 
<laughs> Please, I'll come with you, I think. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you uh, uh, for that question. Uh, next question, please. Here we go. Will you be discussing and or learning from Parks Canada's experience with a Franklin Rex, albeit a very different location with very, very different challenges? So, yeah, Heaven, do you want to take that one from Anne? Yeah. Ab absolutely this is exactly the kind of groups that we'd be looking to communicate with and to talk talk with there's so much experience out there that we that we can draw from it it's fantastic to have uh that resource to draw on the one of the good things about working on shipwreck sites is they're kind of in, they're inherently international projects they're not something that's just done in by a you know one small group in isolation and we, so we can absolutely draw and uh, work very closely with international partners because there's so much um so much knowledge and techniques that we can share from and there's so many lessons that can be learned from other projects yeah thank you yes i had a very interesting conversation with uh, uh, folks from parks canada early on and uh, yeah there's lots of resonance i think uh, very uh, with, so. uh, with what we're talking about with endurance for sure Okay, hey, next question, please. What will be the New Zealand's role in this? <laughs> Maybe I could take that one, actually. Uh, mm. So th I think it's part of the consultative process um, is, is, is absolutely talking to um, everybody who uh, has an interest um, and those stakeholders, if you like, who have a very particular interest. So, of course, New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust, um, you know, very close collaborators of ours at UK AHT um, and look after the Rossi Huts. So key uh, in in some of the decision making here and and, and to consult with so um, very important um, you know people to to be in touch with um, around this project so yeah like lots of people um, who have expertise um, and that's the point here I think as everyone sort of alluded to it's it's bringing in the right expertise to advise and consult with um, to make make this the best possible fu future for the for the ship isn't it okay thank you uh, next question okay. Uh, if the Antarctic Treaty ceased to exist at some point in the future, what would happen to the endurance and who would own the role of its protection? It's a very good, very good question. Uh, John, do you want to have a go at this one? <laughs> well, well, people, people, people quite often say to me, oh, the treaty will come to an end. Um, you know, many people th seem to think that, you know, um, that the treaty will be up for renewal in 2048 because of the, uh, the, the ban on minerals. Uh, that's not the case. The, the, the treaty remains in place indefinitely. Um, so uh, I think I think you've got to be thinking you know, way out of the box to think that the Antarctic Treaty is not going to exist. It's been going very well since it was originally put together in 1957. You know, finally came into force in 1961. Uh, so uh, I'm quite certain that it's it'll be going for at least another hundred years probably longer than that. So uh, uh, I think that uh, the best way to protect the vessel is through the, uh, through the Antarctic Treaty uh, mechanism. And I don't see it uh, coming to a grinding halt anytime soon. <laughs> I'd agree. Thank you. Okay, next question, please. Here we go. How unlikely are you to try to access inside the ship to document the internal condition? Were you able to do that this time? No, I'll, I'll take that one. So, so no, yeah, see, uh, yeah. no, no, the, we, we want that the Saab sabre tooths uh, are too too large to go into companionways or down through the holes in the deck. Um, so, we didn't go inside the ship. Um, you know, is that necessary? Um, personally, I don't. I don't think it is in terms of the, the, the management plan. Um, it would certainly be a very nice thing to do, and certainly, you know, in in terms of technology, you know, I know that talking to Nico Vincent, our subsidy project manager, he, he would be delighted to design a mini robot which could go in and document the internal condition. But these sorts of expeditions are incredibly expensive to, to mount and to run. And for, for the amount of extra information that you can actually obtain, um, I think, I think you're, you're best to keep with what you've got now and we use the data that we have, use it to, to, its, to its maximum to help protect the vessel, rather than thinking, oh, you know, let's go back in a few years' time. Let's use what we've got first and then decide whether anything else is necessary. Thank you. Uh, Evan, any comment on that? Yeah, I, I was just going to add that um, from, from 
what John's saying that you've achieved so far with your millimeter accurate scans of the outside of the hull, it's it's a level of information that's just stunning and un unbelievable. So it's it's there's so much we can we'll be able to tell already from what's been collected so far, and I think that um, that's going to keep archaeologists and and, and and ship researchers busy for for years and years and years to come you know there's so much that can be learned from this so um i think it's it's just a fantastic resource and and it's going to keep yeah keep everybody busy for for such a long time that we don't need to go inside just yet we can learn so much from what's already been collected yeah. And of course, there's the historical records of some fantastic photographs of the interior of the ship that exist already, aren't they, that we can uh, presumably bring together with the with the modern scans. So there's mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of data out there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Uh, next question, please. Ah, OK. Would it be possible to take anything from her? Macklin's diary or the ship's bell? Yeah, John, do you want to take that one first? And, uh... Well, first of all, she's she's protected in situ on the seabed as part of the historic monuments status under the Antarctic Treaty. So you can't just take anything off her. You know, it's um, yep. my view and the view of the trusts and the endurance 22 as an exhibition team is everything remains in situ on the seabed. Um, personally, I wouldn't want to see anything raised from her, such as Macklin's diary or the ship's bell. I think the very best place for those artifacts is on the seafloor, where she's protected under the Antarctic Treaty. Yeah, and heaven. And I, I would There's concur. questions you, you come across all the time with Rex, I guess. Is it... Yes, absolutely. And, and in, in this concept, this is one I'd absolutely concur with the the, the wreck and and all the fixtures and fittings and the personal possessions of, and the, the material that was on board. It is all covered as part of that designation, and and so, yeah, keeping it. In, in situ where it is would, would be the best situation and the best solution for it, I think. Um, uh, you know, we, we often do get questions about lifting artifacts from shipwrecks if they're at risk or, you know, there's a, there's a strong risk of damage or loss. And, and that's the sort of questions that would have to be addressed through the management plan. But in, in this instance, it, from the, what we've seen so far from what John, John's been sharing is, um, is that it's very, very stable and not at risk in that sense. It's it's well preserved and it's the best place for it. So um, that would be our, our starting point. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, next question. Or oh, another question from Brazil, brilliant. Uh, with all the high resolution mapping done on the endurance, is there a possibility of trying to make a replica as, as has happened with other historic ships? Presumably with the LIDAR scanning and things, that is entirely possible, is it? Yes. Yeah, it is actually. And um, another topic that came up with um, my good friend and colleague, Nico Vincent, just the other day, is that because the data is so, so high resolution, you could, you could make it, certainly uh, the computer software engineers are going to be delivering a 3D model of the wreck. Uh, so you, you know, within a matter of months, you'll be able to put um, VR virtual reality goggles on um, and you'll be able to walk along the deck, walk along the sea floor next <laughs> next to the ship, and look up at the ship. You know, it mm -hmm. it is mapped in that sort of detail, and with the the computer technology and processing power which is now available um, to to Voice and to McGill University in Canada, you know, you'll be able to drape or uh, create what's called an ortho mosaic, so you can drape all those photographs over the three D model. So it's as if you're actually there on the ship, uh, which will be absolutely incredible to do. And of course, if you've got a 3D model, then computer generated, there's no reason we couldn't then make a physical model if you wanted to use it for exhibitions, for example. Uh, that would be entirely feasible to do as well. So it is, it, 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 in some respects, it's quite mind blowing what you'll be able to do with this data now that we, we've got it. I think it will be an absolute, you know, a game changer in terms of looking at historic shipwrecks uh, into the future, um, not just for the professional archaeologists like Heffin, but for just members of the public that you can come onto a website uh, and be able to, you know, from from your own home, you know, walk around the wreck. Um, incredible, absolutely incredible. 
I mean, this is transformative technology, isn't it, Heffin? I mean, we're using this in AHT for the historic huts we look after because it enables you exactly to visit them without visiting them and make decisions about them without visiting yeah. them. Is this something that you're using, you know, in historic England? I mean, you see these things around, Ab don't you? Absolutely. It's it's such an important thing for us in that um, so shipwreck sites have historically been out of sight, out of mind, you know, get, getting that experience with sharing that experience with the general public has been pretty much impossible you, you can achieve a certain amount with photographs and, and reports but but it's it's nothing compared to actually um, experiencing it for yourselves and so we, we've developed a big program of, of virtual dive trails for our protected wrecks uh, and there's I think we've got 15 dive trails now that are available from the Historic Kingdom website and they're a, they're a mix um, of things like photogrammetry uh, where you've got you know perfectly accurate recreations of the shipwreck sites on the seabed through to uh, more uh, interpretive things using computer game software and things. And so the, these are a great way to, to bring shipwreck sites to the general public and to get people experiencing it. And then, and we find that it, you know, people are fascinated. They're, they're really excited and you can share that. It, you get more people engaged and it, it helps to justify further research and for, you know further work on on shipwreck sites because people are engaged and are excited and they want to know more. Mm, that's absolutely right. So yeah, and also must much, much more sustainable, isn't it? It's a way to examine and, and experience the ship without having to get on a ship yourself. <laughs> so, sure, it's got to be a good thing. Okay, um, are there any other Antarctic wrecks which you'd like to identify and photograph? So, have you got, this whet your appetite, John, for uh, Antarctic wreck finding. Okay, well, um, probably quite a few of your your viewers tonight will have heard about uh, Norden's scholarship, the Antarctic. So uh, she was also trapped in ice in the Weddell Sea to the north of uh, where she, um, the Endurance sank. Uh, she sank near a place called Paulette Island. Um, but she's on the seafloor. Um, has never been has never been located, let alone filmed or surveyed. So the, yeah, the, the, the Antarctic would be a, an interesting one uh, to get to go and ha have, have a search for. Um, whether you'd ever get the opportunity uh, is a different matter, because these expeditions you know, cost millions of pounds to, 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 to pull together. Um, and you've got to have some pretty deep pockets to be heading off to Paulette Island to look for the Antarctic. That's for sure. That's for sure. Thank you. Yeah, next question, please. <laughs> 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 this, is, this is what we all need to know. Are there any bottles of scotch in the ship? And if so, would they have survived the pressure, assuming they were well stoppered? <laughs> Do you want me to let, say that one? Go for it, yes. Uh, so, so, yes, yeah, Shackleton had a little store of goodies. Um, and he would bring, bring out... Um, whiskey, uh, other bottles of spirits, uh, chocolates, cakes, particularly for people's birthdays, midwinter day. Um, so that store cupboard is on the endurance. Um, my understanding from the diaries is no one mentions spirits in the diaries. So yes, yeah, so probably there are bottles of scotch on the ship. Um, would they have survived the pressure? Um, I don't know. Who knows? I think is the answer to that one. Um, but yeah, there are there are there are probably bottles of scotch on that ship still. But there are other artifacts you did see, weren't there? I mean, you saw. Is, did I recall right? You saw boots and that, and that sort of thing that were easily. Yeah. So, so so on the on the deck, um, mm. that, that that was yeah, absolutely incredible to see. So there are plates, mugs, saucepans, um, boots. Um, Probably the most amazing thing that we found was a was a flare gun. Um, a lot of your viewers will be thinking, why on earth did they have a flare gun? Well, well, of course, they were using flare guns as basically for distress. Uh, they fly a, f a flare up into the to, up, up into the air or a detonator. And um, in Frank Hurley's diary, there's a, a diary entry actually on the 21st of November, 1915. Um, where he goes, because they're always going back to that. They've abandoned it by that stage, but they're always going back to the wreck to try and find bits and pieces which might be useful for them on, on, uh, whilst they're camping on the ice. And uh, Hurley goes back to the ship. Uh, they find this flare pistol and they fire it off uh, to salute the flag, knowing that the vessel is about to, to sink in the next, well, they didn't know, but uh, you know, she sinks within the next few hours. So they fire the flare gun 
and um, Hurley records putting it down on the poop deck. And um, lo and behold, 170 years later, we find the flare deck, the flare gun. Yeah. So it, it, you know, that, that to me is one of the most amazing um, discoveries. And, a very, and it's so tangible that you can link mm. it directly back to one of the most you know, iconic people on the expedition, Frank Hurley. It's in his diary that he fired the flare gun on the day she sinks. It, 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 history doesn't get much better than that, does it? Doesn't, does it? <laughs> <laughs> does it get more real, does it? Goodness. <laughs> Incredible. Um, next question, please. Thank you. Uh, Michael says, I was under the impression that endurance was severely crushed by ice. Is the ship entirely intact? If so, amazing. Or broken into many pieces? And what is the area of the spread of debris? Shall I take that one? Um, please do. Yeah, please. So... Uh... So, so, so it's not entirely true that she, she was certainly um, pinched by the ice and, um, and the ice gradually went over her and basically the, partly she sank because of uh, the rudder um, parting from the stern and water coming into the vessel, but also the pressure of the ice going on top of the vessel as she got lower in the water. So she's actually in incredible condition. She hasn't, she hasn't split in two. She's completely intact. She's not broken into many pieces at all. Uh, it really is quite an amazing that you have a complete, a complete shipwreck um, uh, at that depth, uh, and after having been in ice for so many months, being gradually uh, pinched and crushed. Uh, and actually, there's very little spread of debris um, because she didn't break apart. Then. Um, the, the ship is in, intact. So there's very little debris. There is some debris around the, around the vessel, uh, I think primarily caused from when she actually hit the sea floor. Um, but there's no big de debris field. That, that was one of the things that we were looking for. Um, often with these sorts of wrecks, you can see a scattering of debris, particularly things like coal. And we knew that um, she had a coal fire, um, uh, a steam, steam engine on board, coal fired. So we were expecting to see bits of coal, which might lead us to the wreck. Um, there was none of that. Um, she just basically appeared as one whole whole ship mm. on the sea floor. Amazing, isn't it? She, she kind of pinched by the ice. Ice came over and she just drifted down, <laughs> sort of yeah. with a gentle bump. It's a, it's yeah. kind of extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, is that I mean, Heffern, is that usual, unusual? Is that, is that something you've seen before? Or is it so, so, is that, yeah. I think for the shipwrecks that we work with, around the coast of England, we, we're dealing with a really, really, really dynamic uh, coastline, you know, storm actions, rocky shores around the coast of Cornwall, for example. So it's a, it's a very, very different environment. And so a lot of the time, the wrecks we have to deal with are um, severely uh, broken apart and dispersed and spread in all directions. But we, we see the, the full range, really. I think that's what's so exciting about dealing with shipwrecks in that, you know, sometimes what you've got in the seabed is uh, a handful of cannons and nothing else left because all the timbers have been uh, eroded away, have been, you know, eaten by by uh, organisms, and all have been um, just just destroyed through uh, the the physical processes of being on the seabed. Uh, but in other circumstances, um, the Goodwin Sands off the coast of Kent is a good example. These are uh, huge mobile sandbanks that that move around, and uh, you know, the, it's uh, it swallows up shipwrecks essentially, and so you can get you can get ships that are fantastically preserved and then they'll be buried completely you know out of sight for hundreds of years and then as those sandbanks migrate around the shipwrecks become exposed and so there's a there's a fantastic preservation again but it's quite mm -hmm. different to what john was describing with the the endurance being in such good condition and and stable because it's a a um Sort of a, you know, a calm and, and safe environment, but somewhere like 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 the Goodwin Sands off Kent, where it's uh, uh, very very dynamic, and so you can go from a fantastic preservation for hundreds of years to a very very rapid process of decay. Fascinating. So if you're going to wreck your ship, then the Weddell Sea is the place to do it <laughs> to survive. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, I think we've got one more time for one more question. Yeah. So. For the here we go. So how accurate, so this is finding the ship. So how accurate was Frank Worsley's navigation and was the wreck found where he said it was? So John. Okay. So I've already described Frank Worsley. You know, he was the, he was the man who saved, saved them because of his navigation pr 
Paris. Um, we found the wreck, uh, it was about seven kilometers to the south of Worsley's original sinking location. Um, and don't forget when Worsley took that position, um, uh, yeah, they were on the, they'd abandoned the ship, they were living on the ice, they weren't sure whether they were gonna live or whether they're gonna die. Um, he had been unable to take a sextant reading um, because of bad weather. So he took one on the 18th and one on the 22nd. Um, so the actual position of the endurance when she sank on the 21st, um, it, that was an estimated position um, because he couldn't get a sextant reading. So through all of that, to then find that the ship is so near to his original sinking coordinates is really quite incredible. Um, you know, using the technology that they had at that time to pinpoint the wreck in so precisely is just phenomenal. Um, what, what we think actually happened, you know, what, what, you know, because there'd be some people, why is the discrepancy? Why wasn't it bang on? Um, well, uh, what Worsley really couldn't factor in was the, the drift of the sea ice in his calculations. And so there was probably, probably a drift to the south um, and that's when the ship, the ship sank, which meant that you know, he, he didn't quite get that um, uh, factored into his calculations. So that's why she's a bit further to the south, because she was taken in the ice a bit further to the south and then sank. But even so, you know, seven kilometers to the, to the south of your original sinking position, um, incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Yeah, after 107 years, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Well, I think um, I would like to talk about this for another hour, actually, but I'm afraid we can't. But, so thank you both so, so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with you both um, in the coming months and years to, on the protection of the, of the endurance. Um, so more soon. Are we, John, we can't wait to see uh, what comes out of the endurance expedition, endurance ratio expedition um, archives and and the models and things. So uh, watch this space. Um so thank you so much for both of you for sharing your expertise and your insights. I mean, really, really fascinating. And it feels like there's still still much to be revealed and much for us um, have been particularly for us to be thinking about over the coming months. So thank you very much, both of you. Oh, like thank you, thank you Camilla. Oh, pleasure. I mean, we'd, let's do this again sometime. <laughs> so thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us tonight and for sharing your questions. I'm sorry we can only answer a few of them, but um, we might uh, stay on and answer some of them by text. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been a riveting um, evening, I think. Uh, but please let us know what you thought of it uh, by leaving your comments uh, or getting in touch with us by email or on social media. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, if you haven't already, uh, please do consider supporting our work at UK Sheet. We can only protect heritage uh, with your support. Um, you can become a member. You can adopt a penguin for this Christmas. Of course, Christmas is coming. Um, do your Christmas shopping with us, of course. Or you can support our Big Give campaign, which it launches next week, uh, where every donation you make will be doubled. So definitely give that your consideration if you can. All of it, all your gifts help us to continue to protect our Antarctic heritage, whether they're huts or whether they're ships. Um, and you can find more details in the link in the comments. Um, and uh, I think uh, on the slide, I think. Yeah, there we go. Um, our next event uh, will be on the 13th of December when we'll be considering Antarctic foods. So something quite different uh, with the great Antarctic menu. So don't miss that one. That's going to be fascinating, I think. Um, so please join us again for that. Uh, you can sign up for it from the link in the comments uh, or on our website. Um, and we'll be also posting on social media. So do join us for that. But for now, thank you, everyone, for making this such an enjoyable evening. And I look forward to seeing you all again at the next Antarctica Insight Live. Good night. Good night. <laughs>